extra special VIP pass into the world of Matilda the Musical based on the book by Roald Dahl. Today we're going back to where it all began, inside the imagination of a legendary author. Let's discover the magic of Roald Dahl. You feel with Roald Dahl that he's just a big naughty boy with one finger up his nose and another in mud, you know. He somehow writes about childhood in a way that's very authentic and yet it's not trying to be childish. She's not condescending. It's sort of a glorious celebration of the sort of grottiness and the angles and the inkiness of childhood. How do you begin to describe a six foot six? Brilliant, imaginative, amusing, wonderful man. And he always said, life should be filled with treats. And he didn't mean you know, expensive presents or anything silly like that. Things like the milk would be dyed pink for the children in the morning. The cows delivered pink milk that day. And then he would suddenly say, well, of course, the sausages you're eating, you know, there's only, they're made for only two people, me and the queen. The children were fascinated by Royal. You know, he used to really take their side and encourage them to walk along a, a wall or climb a tree or enter dangerous territory, which of course they loved. It was all those small gestures that made life such fun. And I think that is relayed definitely in his literature. He had a very funny way of writing. And then these imaginative, magical worlds, and always at the center, an underdog, a poor child. Somehow in these joyous, wondrous worlds that he writes, he manages to have that same sort of brutality of of observation that manages to not be cold. Kids love it. And I don't think there's ever been anyone like him. It took him at least a year to two years to do one book, and it would go through endless changes. So he'd be particularly grumpy when he ended a book. And I used to say, gosh, aren't you thrilled you finished? And he'd say, no, because you know, Liz, I've now got to think of starting another one. And will I be able to do it? That's what worried him. If you ever went and saw his writing hut, so he was six foot six, and he had incredible pain in his back from his injuries. And he had incredible pain in his heart from all sorts of grief in his life. And, and he'd go and sit in this hut, in this armchair, and write these stories. There we are in Ross's actual hut where he came every day. But it's, it's really lovely. Little happy birthday done in flower petals by Lucy, his youngest daughter. Everything was invented. His lamp, it, the spring went, so he hung a golf ball so that it was the perfect height over his hands when he was writing. This is his writing board that he made himself. And then he'd put his legs on the school trunk, which was filled with logs so that it didn't move. He'd sweep out the bays with a uh, clothes brush, which his mother made for him. Then he'd put his paper down, sharpen his pencils in the American pencil sharpener and get to work and write until one o'clock. Then he would come down the garden path, have prawns and lettuce, and of course, chocolate. At about half past three, he would go back to the hut till six o'clock, and then he'd come down six, 6.30, and have his dinner. He always used to say, stop when the going's good. And he was taught that by Hemingway, because he said, then you can't wait to get back to it the next morning. I think he was saying, stand up for yourself if you're in trouble, make good friends, and respect the good people, and down with the bad. 